Hi there. Thanks for joining us this morning. My name is Crystal Del Mosso, and I'll be the moderator for this session. So if there are any technical difficulties, feel free to um, let me know on the plat uh, the in the chat on the platform. So thanks for joining us for this session, Novel Benzos, the next uh, US drug epidemic. Um, and I will talk about our session presenter in just one second. I'm gonna start with just a few reminders. The session is being recorded and it's going to be available on the conference platform one hour after our session ends. So we're asking that you keep yourself muted unless our presenter asks you to unmute. Um, make sure you join sessions live today because we're going to do a prize drawing from the attendance within each session. So you do want to um, attend all the sessions today. Uh, the conference is also offering free continuing education no, credits. So for more information on those, visit, visit the uh, continuing education page. And so I am pleased to introduce Mr. Ben Westoff today. He is an award-winning investigative reporter based in St. Louis. Um, one of his books, Fentanyl Incorporated, How Rogue Chemists Created the Deadliest Wave of the Opioid e Epidemic, is the bombshell first book about fentanyl epidemic. And he has advised officials at the top levels of government about the crisis, including um, U.S. Senate, and the House of Representatives, the White House, um, the Office of National uh, Drug Control Policy, the DEA, and the U.S. State Department. He has written for The Atlantic, The Wall Street Journal, The Rolling Stones, and The Guardian. And just wait, because in May, another book comes out. Um, Westoff's next book, The Little Brother, um, is about the murder of his mentee in, in the Big Brothers, Big Sisters program. So um, it's my pleasure to introduce Mr. Ben Westoff um, to speak to us today. Thank you, Crystal. I really appreciate it. And thanks everyone for tuning in. I am happy to take questions throughout. Um, some of this stuff I'm getting into might be a little complicated. So please, if you don't understand, pipe up um, you know, in the chats or however you'd like. Uh, I will also take questions at the end, but you know, you're not throwing me off at all. Uh, so anyway, so thank you very much for coming. Um, I am going to load my slideshow here. And uh, make sure everybody's muted. I'm, I think some people might not be muted. Okay. All right. Please let me know if there's if you can't see the slideshow correctly as well, but I think we are rolling. So the first thing I want to thank my research assistant, Andrew Chamberlain, for his help with this project, um, which began as a story that we worked together on for my drugs and hip hop newsletter. So Uh, he talked to a guy that we're calling Gregory Harper. This, uh, this is not Gregory pictured here, but, but Gregory had a big problem. When he woke up one morning in April 2020, he found himself sitting in an Austin, Texas jail. Uh, he was 21 years old, and he had crashed his car the night before through the gate of somebody's home. Uh, he'd also, for some bizarre reason, stolen $300 worth of fishing supplies. Why did he do all this? He had absolutely no idea. Somewhere along the way, his brand new Nissan Sentra burned up as well. It started on fire. The seats were burned out. It was just a black shell. So it was a very crazy night, but Gregory couldn't remember a thing about it. And he still doesn't. It turns out, you know, all he remembers is that he was drinking and that he had taken what looked like a Xanax bar, which he bought from a local dealer. But the pill was a knockoff. It didn't contain alprazolam, which is the drug in Xanax. Instead, it contained a little known analog of the drug that was much stronger. So in other words, it was a fake pill. You're, we're hearing about these types of stories more and more. 
Overdoses from benzodiazepines, also known as benzos, have been rising in recent years. In fact, they're now killing more Americans than ever before, almost always when combined with opioids and or alcohol. Really right now though, the, the, the headlines are dominated by the opioid crisis. And so you barely ever hear about benzos at all. And which, which leaves benzos as a very severe yet very underreported and, and largely unknown threat. So you, pro you probably know that Americans take a ton of benzos. Um, Xanax and Valium are the most famous brands. Uh, between 1996 and 2013, the number of people filing benzo prescriptions went from about 8 million to well over 13 million. Uh, this timeline corresponded with the onset of the opioid crisis, and it's gotten much worse since then. As of 2019, 16% of opioid overdose deaths also involved benzos. Um, even though they're prescribed traditionally, benzos are also highly abused, and something like 17% of people who are prescribed them abuse them. And just for a little context, fully 13% of Americans are prescribed benzos, which is just an insanely high number when you think about it. Um, and the, the deaths, these deaths from benzos are a problem all over the world. There are reports out of New England showing that benzos are involved in almost 40% of overdose deaths. Uh, in British Columbia, Canada, it's up over 60%. So meaning at, of every single person who died from a drug overdose death, of all of those, 60% of those had benzos involved. Um, in the UK, benzos are particularly devastating to the youth population, people between 15 and 21. Um, but increasingly, the problem isn't just the prescribed benzos. It's so-called novel benzos, and you can also call them designer benzos with names like clonazolam and fluoralprazolam. These are names most people don't know. They're, they're not used in medicine and they're not prescribed in the US at all, but they're starting to create all sorts of havoc when distributed on the black market. And the, the, the end result is that people like this guy, Gregory Harper, who ended up in the Austin jail, don't even know what they're taking. So, so this is a big problem. So how did we get here? Um, we'll start with barbiturates, which are a class of sedatives that were particularly popular in the mid 20th century. They were prescribed for anxiety and insomnia, but they're also very dangerous. Uh, Marilyn Monroe had barbiturates in her system when she died in 1962. Um, so benzos were, created and supposed to be a safer alternative. And when they debuted, they largely displaced barbiturates. This is the inventor of Valium, um, Dr. Leo Sternbach. He's actually kind of known as the father of benzos. He was a medical chemist born and educated in Eastern Europe before he came to work for the Swiss drug company, the Swiss drug company Hoffman La Roche. These were different times, and so Sternbach actually tested the drugs he created on himself. He would uh, create a drug and try it at a very small dose and see if it had any sort of reaction, and then gradually increase the dose uh, until it did. Um, in this way, he was kind of like Sasha Shulgin, who is the so-called so godfather of ecstasy, and out of his California lab, he created more than a hundred designer psychedelics. Um, and this was, you know, uh, kind of an approach people took when human trials weren't really ethical. You know, if you're, if you're testing something that doesn't have sort of a scientifically sound underpinning, it's, it's not really ethical to test it on people and testing it on animals doesn't, you know, when you're, when you're testing very specific drugs like Valium that are supposed to 
relieve these very specific symptoms, it doesn't make much sense to test them on animals. And so Sternbach tested them on himself. But, but unlike this guy, Sasha Shulgin, who made all these psychedelics, Sternbach worked very much within the system. And he first invented uh, a benzo called uh, labrium. And, and that, was, that was very successful, but it was, it was Valium that was the, the first real blockbuster drug. Um, it worked for, for sleepiness, it worked for anxiety, like, like barbiturates, but, it was, but, but unlike barbiturates, it was considered non-toxic. And so how benzos work is that they attach to a receptor in the brain that activates a neurotransmitter called GABA. So um, I know this diagram is a little confusing, but all you need to know is that GABA makes people feel very calm. And what made Valium such a revelation is that it started to, to make people feel calm immediately. Um, uh, the chairman of the psychiatry department at Columbia, whose name is Def Dr. Jeffrey A. Lieberman, told the New York Times that Valium represents one of the major milestones in recent psychopharmacology. It began a transition from drugs that were heavy handed to drugs that are now much more precise and selective in their activity. So again, there was this sense that Valium was safe and that it was very effective. Um, so, so Valium became the first billion dollar drug and it was marketed by none other than Arthur Sackler from the famous, the infamous Sackler family who was responsible for OxyContin. It was also um, founded widely portrayed in pop culture. So you may remember the quote from the movie Annie Hall, I'm too tense, I need a Valium. Um, <laughs> yeah, Woody Allen, exactly. So, so yeah, so the, the Sackler family, which I mentioned, you probably know about them because they marketed OxyContin and have recently been the subject of lawsuits all around the country. And um, the Sackler family were, I mean, they were definitely unethical and they caused a lot of misery, but they were also sort of geniuses when it came to marketing pharmaceutical drugs to the average person. And Valium was was found in like medicine cabinets all throughout the country. And uh, like we said, in, in pop culture, um, you may also remember the Rolling Stones 1966 song, Mother's Little Helper. Um, Mother needs something to calm her down. Mother needs something today to calm her down. And though she's not really ill, there's a little yellow pill she goes running for the shelter of a mother's little helper. So you can get a sense of just how mainstream this drug was. Um, and of course the inventor, Leo Sternbach, always knew of uh, Valium's potential for abuse. In fact, his wife wouldn't even let him take it. Um, in the 1970s, a London scientist studied the addiction patterns of benzos. He initially thought people got addicted because they began taking more and more. But really, all most people had done was just stay on their regular prescribed dosages. So Valium was followed soon by Klonopin, Ativan, and then in 1981, Xanax which was the first benzodiazepine granted FDA approval for panic disorder. And Xanax remains a blockbuster drug to this day. By 2018, Americans were filling 21 million Xanax prescriptions every year. Like I said, benzos were touted for their safety and they remain very unlikely to kill you in and of themselves but when combined with opioids or alcohol, they can be lethal. That's because like opioids and alcohol, benzos are sedatives. So these drug combinations can slow one's breathing to a stop. And you hear about this over and over and over um, with opioid use disorder patients um, 
that they're, these are poly drug users who often aren't just using opioids, but they're combining them with Xanax or other benzos. And the problem is that unlike with benzos, for which an overdose can be reversed with Narcan, there is no antidote for overdose when it comes to benzos. This is unfortunate because Xanax has become just as ubiquitous in pop culture as Valium was. In fact, maybe even more so, especially among young people. Um, raise your hand if you can identify this rapper. Um, well, I can't see most of you because you don't have your picture on, but uh, so I'll just tell you, uh, this is the rapper Future, very popular uh, along with rappers like Lil Wayne. They, they mention they talk about Xanax a lot in their songs. In some ways it's become hip hop's favorite sedative, uh, displacing lean, which is uh, soda combined with codeine, promethazine, cough syrup. That was originally popularized in, in Houston. That's an that's a opioid too, um, and led to the deaths of many prominent rappers. Yep, syrup. Exactly. Um, so we have a comment from from Ann Ella Fritz in SUD patient in SUD treatment. We often saw patients who mixed alcohol and benzos and had no memory of large chunks of time, car accidents, almost fugue state. Yep, that's that is absolutely correct. I've heard so many stories like this, um, and it's just and it's it it's gotten even worse with the novel benzos, which I'm going to uh, which I'm going to get to in a minute here. Um, there, there's even a rapper who's named Little Zan, if you can believe that, um, who is this guy. Um, although following the death of the rapper Little Peep, who also had benzos in his system when he died, more recently Little, Little Zan announced that he was going to change his name to Diego, reflecting his real name, which is Nathaniel Diego Lienos. I mean, I don't know, I have young children and the thought of them listening to, to rappers who glorify benzos and prescription pills, it just really scares the life out of me. And the, these videos are very kind of dreamy. They're very kind of like, they, they sort of capture the emotional state of what it's like to take these pills. And it's all bright colors and, um, you know, young people, um looking like zombies walking through these videos and it's it just it really terrifies me uh other celebrities who've had benzos in their system when they died included Brittany murphy actor heath ledger and the rapper mac and each time these deaths were in combination with other drugs oh sorry Having trouble with my hair here yeah, so Adrian was saying huge in school in the 2010s, unfortunately. Yeah, it's, I think basically the idea is that people think these are prescription pills from a doctor. You know, these were issued by a doctor. They, these aren't drugs, this is medicine. And that's the big problem. So novel benzos have made the whole thing worse. Um, novel benzos are a type of novel psychoactive substance, also known as NPS. And these basically refer to any recreational drug you've never heard of. These drugs are all synthetic, they're popularized on the internet, and they're usually made in Chinese labs. So here on the left, you can see the chemical structure of Xanax, aka Alprazolam. And then to the right, these are two of the most popular designer benzos or novel benzos, clonazolam and fluoralprazolam. You can usually recognize their names because they have am at the end and lots of L's and P's and O's and A's. Uh, you can see how the chemical structures are very similar. So these are analogs of alprazolam and they're specifically manufactured by rogue chemists because their mode of action is similar to traditional benzos, but, but their chemical structures are just slightly different, making them legal to manufacture in places like China. And yet, despite their similar structures, 
They can be anywhere from two times to five to five times stronger than Xanax. Xanax was the first drug I manipulated my doctor for. Yeah, well, I, I, I totally believe it. That's certainly still going on today in a big way. Um, some of these novel benzos are in a weird legal gray area. So take etizolam, which is one of the most widely used novel benzos. Like most novel benzos, it was developed in a traditional lab, actually in Japan in the 1970s. And it was approved there for anxiety and sleep disorders. It still remains widely used and abused in Japan, but it was never approved by the FDA in the United States. Yet it's still sold clandestinely on illicit markets in North America. And it's, it's clearly a big problem, although just exactly how big is very difficult to tell because it's, um, you know, that's not usually tested for in toxicology screenings. That's because there are just so many new drugs coming online so quickly. Um, when you talked about NPS, novel psychoactive substances, which includes novel benzos, novel opioids, novel psychedelics, um, novel cannabinoids, which are sometimes referred to as synthetic marijuana. There are literally hundreds of new drugs every year. And most toxicologists just are overwhelmed. Um, the, the dark web is also another place where novel benzos are sold. Um, and the drugs, of course, are, can be delivered right to someone's front door. Um, because an IP is disguised on the dark web, it's almost impossible for law enforcement to catch up with a lot of these dealers. Um, and of course, mislabeling of the drugs is common. Um, the only, you know, maybe perhaps saving grace of some of these dark websites is that they have an Amazon style rating system. And so if they're selling a different drug than they say they're selling, or they're selling something that's cut or something that's particularly dangerous, um, you know, the customer feedback will uh, be negative and then people might use a different site. So, you know. It's, it's certainly not a, a perfect system, but um, buying drugs from the sketchy corner dealer is certainly not any better. Um, and then Terry says, just saw a person with Xanax pressed with fentanyl and cocaine, overdosed and has problems with memory of the incident. Yeah, absolutely. I, I've never heard of Xanax pressed with cocaine inside of it, but certainly with fentanyl and, um, the problem is just a very bad time to be a young person right now um, if, if you're interested in experimenting with drugs because literally any pill or any powder can have fentanyl in it and you can overdose. And so, um, you know, back in the day, the days of just showing up to a party and someone's got some lines on the table, I mean, those days are long. Being able to count on your safety, those days are long, long gone. So, um, so novel benzos are probably illegal under the US Federal Analog Act because it automatically schedules any new drug that's similar to a drug that's already scheduled, okay? So even though there are these hundreds of new drugs coming online, um, the US law doesn't have to be changed um, to, to, to uh, schedule every single one because of the, the Federal Analog Act. But, but still, these, these, these novel benzos like clonazolam, they're not explicitly scheduled, okay, which can sometimes make prosecutions at the local level difficult. You know, like I said, it's, a, it's a, the Federal Analog Act, and I just recently heard of a case, I think in New York State, where police... Um, caught someone who had a bunch of these novel benzos and couldn't, uh, because it was being prosecuted at the local level, couldn't um, get a conviction because these, you know, these drugs weren't illegal on the local level. Plus, you know, it's not always clear what similar means exactly, right? So if, if alprazolam is scheduled and clonazolam, you know, is it, is it similar in the course of action? Is it similar in the effects? Is it similar in the chemical structure? 
you know, in this case, you would probably say yes to those questions, but in a lot of cases, it's very hard to prove, especially to a jury, what exactly similar entails. Um, and in China, there is no analog act at all. So that means that each new drug has to be scheduled one by one by one. So for my book, Fentanyl Inc., I, uh, I went to China, I actually went undercover in, uh, in drug labs, and I got to see this process up close. And what, what happens is that these, these Chinese labs sort of specialize in this kind of gray area. And because novel benzos, because they start out completely legal in China, these labs specialize in this kind of narrow window when a new drug has become popularized on the internet but before it is banned. So eventually, you know, clonazolam, the other novel benzos, eventually they will get scheduled in China. What usually happens is they're scheduled in the US first, they're scheduled national, uh, internationally, and then they're scheduled in China. But it's a very slow bureaucratic process. And so it's often, you know, like a year or more between when we start seeing these novel benzos and other drugs on American streets, and they actually get banned in China. It's, it's kind of a constant cat and mouse game between the government and manufacturers. Um, and during this window is when most of these Chinese labs are, make most of their money. So that's why, so, you know, and it, it's increasingly not just China even, there's a, India has a very robust market of um, a very robust chemical industry, you know, the vast majority of which is dedicated to make making legal sort of above board chemicals, but a, a you know a sizable part of which is making these type of recreational drugs, and they're sometimes called research chemicals, which is sort of a euphemistic name um, designed to confuse law enforcement. I think you know that, and these these chemicals are not actually being used for research purposes but instead for recreational purposes. So, so these are the reasons, you know, this is, this is a, a clear web site and you, you see these drugs for sale, not just on the dark web, but all over the clear web. And I just, you know, called this site up uh, a couple of days ago. Um, and it's, it's for a, a novel Benzo and it's right on the clear web. Um, this, this company, like many of these Chinese chemical, chemical companies, is located on the east coast of China, just a few hours south of Shanghai. And, you know, the, the websites are all fairly professional looking. Um, in addition to these recreational drugs, these companies also make traditional, you know, fully legal chemicals as well. Um, sometimes, in fact, they offer thousands and thousands of different chemicals, everything from Viagra to pesticides to anabolic steroids. Um, and they'll often offer custom chemicals made to your specifications, which can basically be an invitation to, to order new novel benzos and other drugs from them, um, you know, that are so under the radar, most people haven't even heard of them yet. So, so yeah, so this is from the same website and, um, you know, you'll notice that the English is not always perfect on these sites, but, but nonetheless, you know, they, they try to present themselves as reputable. I, I'm sure these pictures are not taken from the actual company, although you never know. Um, but, but often they have these you know, these pictures of the, the labs that they're really, you know, make, made to look very sparkling, clean and professional. The labs that I visited actually were, um, I wouldn't say they looked as, as fancy as like US big pharma labs, but they definitely um, are functional. You know, the, the chemicals that they produce are really at a high rate of purity. I mean, they, they take these, they take the production of these chemicals very seriously. Um, you know, and, and, and as I've been showing you, they have their contact information, you know, sometimes even their actual addresses of the businesses right on the site. 
Um, you know, they don't really fear. I wouldn't say they're like, they, they, these chemicals are very clearly advertised to Western customers, you know, but at the same time, they're not exactly fearful from Chinese law enforcement because, you know, these chemicals are perfectly legal. So the, the Chinese companies usually just make the raw powder and they send it to middlemen in the US or Europe who press it up into pills. And so the, you know, a pill pressing machine like this is actually pretty easy to acquire. And, um, and they press up the, the novel benzo powders into tabs, you know, bars or, or tablets that look exactly like the prescription pills like Xanax. I mean, in a lot of cases, some cases, you know, they, they might not look quite as professional, but for the average unsuspecting user, it would be very hard to tell the difference. You know, and like, and even though the bulk of the ingredients are coming from China, the pressing itself is, is, usually, is often done by American mom and pop enterprises. So if you hear about these busts, it's often two people working in an apartment, uh, often couples, and you hear that they, they've made thousands and thousands of pills and these machines just churn them out. You know, they can make hundreds or even thousands per hour. And, um, and the markup is incredible. I mean, a, a kilo of novel benzos or, or, or fentanyl, something like that, it can be only a, a few thousand dollars. And so that, that's enough to make thousands of pills and the, the pills that might be sold for five dollars ten dollars each and um you know the the profit margin is just out of this world so mexico is also contributing to the proliferation of the the gray market benzos these novel benzos in the u.s so the you know one good thing is that the the mexican cartels don't appear to yet be heavily trafficking in novel benzos. Um, instead, they, they focus on fentanyl. You know, traditionally, they've been focused on heroin, and, and most heroin that's still grown in the US, excuse me, most heroin that's used in the US is grown in Mexico. And, um, but, but fentanyl is largely displacing heroin because it's so much cheaper, it's so much more easy to make um, synthetically. And it's so much smaller. It takes it's fifty, you know, um, fifty kilos of heroin is equivalent to one kilo of fentanyl. So, so the the Mexican cartels are mostly focused on that trade as well as cocaine and meth. But the problem is that these benzos are sold in standard, you know, legal Mexican pharmacies with no prescription needed. And thus, it's very easy for U.S. drug dealers to, to buy this when they go across the border. Pictured in this slide is basically Mexican Xanax, and it is um, certainly not subject to the rigorous safety standards of actual Xanax. So, so, the, question, so the question remains, like, why are these novel benzos taking over the market? I mean, um, certainly, like we said, 13% of Americans are prescribed pharmaceutical benzos. And so, you know, there would seem to be an adequate supply of the, you know, the actual drug itself. So to answer that, you know, it has to do in part with the fentanyl trade. And um, so before 2019, fentanyl analogs, or you could call them novel fentanyls, we're, um, we're like novel benzos are now. They're completely legal in China. So these are a bunch of examples of fentanyl analogs. And again, you can see that the basic chemical structure is mostly the same on these. You know, on the, on the left side, they've got the, the oxygen molecule, the double bond connected to the nitrogen and the benzo ring coming off the nitrogen. Um, so again, it's a situation where these, these fentanyl analogs have often the same type of effect as fentanyl, but because the chemical structure is just a tiny bit different, they were, they were legal. Although in some cases, like car fentanyl 
it's actually much, much stronger than fentanyl. They say a hundred times stronger than fentanyl, which is already 50 times stronger than heroin. And carfentanil was used traditionally as a, as a tranquilizer for giant animals like rhinos and elephants. And these, all of these analogs, just like the novel benzos, these weren't created by, you know, rogue chemists from scratch. Generally, these were invented in traditional laboratories from chemists, uh, medical chemists who were trying to patent these drugs. And so some of them did become patented and used like carfentanil in veterinary practices. But a lot of these were never patented and they just sort of sat around in uh, medical journals gathering dust on university shelves for a lot of years until the dawn of the internet. And so once the internet came around, all of these papers started getting uploaded to the internet. And so these rogue chemists could kind of, if they know, knew where to look, could identify um, these never produced, never FDA approved, never marketed drugs that they thought could, could be a hit on the recreational market. And so that's part of the reason we're seeing these hundreds of new drugs per year. And, and fentanyl uh, analogs were, were the worst of them coming around to 2019. But, but, but that year that changed um, and China finally blanket banned all of these chemicals. So like I said before, China before was just scheduling every drug. When I, and I use the term ban and schedule interchangeably. So China was, was banning these drugs one by one by one by one. But this was the middle of the trade war between the US and China and fentanyl suddenly became like the hot, the hot button issue. And so it was kind of used by Trump as both the carrot and the stick. Like they said, if they, you know, if they banned the fentanyl analogs, um, they would, the Trump said he would relax tariffs and if not, you know, make make life more miserable concerning trade. Um, so in response, China broke precedent and blanket banned all the fentanyl analogs, meaning that any new drug that was structurally similar to fentanyl was automatically banned. And so, so everyone thought this was great at the time, right? I mean, these drugs are banned. Well, the problem was that almost immediately we started seeing non-fentanyl opioids like ISO, and um, the, which the Chinese labs started making and we started seeing killing people in America. And so why, why ISO? Well, because it's not a fentanyl, but it's still an opioid and thus was technically legal under Chinese law. And so this is, this is a story that repeats itself and repeats itself. And what's happening right now is, is it's happening with the novel benzos. So this is you know, the proliferation of, of all these, these novel benzos. And here's some more examples here, is that uh, again, these are, these are brand new chemicals. They're usually stolen from uh, old, uh, chemical journals and university publications from years, sometimes decades ago. And because they're, they're legal, they're, they're made by these Chinese labs and sold as recreational drugs. They're pressed up into pills to look like Xanax. And um, it's basically the new kind of legal way for these Chinese companies to make money. And they weren't doing it in a large way before the, the fentanyl analogs ban. So it's, it's pretty much in direct response to that. And, you know, another, pro another problem is that the, um, the whole situation has been exacerbated by the pandemic. So, you know, you can see the chart here measures the change in frequency of drug use since the start of the pandemic. So, you know, keep in mind, though, even though it says prescription benzos, um, it actually refers to benzos generally, including novel benzos, because most people don't actually know what type of benzos they're taking. And that also applies to toxicology reports as well. So, so I'm, heard, I'm sure you've heard about so-called Xanax pills being adulterated with fentanyl. 
which is very common. I think someone in the comment section just talked about that. So, so this is, is really killing a tons, tons of people, um, including a lot of people in the Western part of the country. Um, you know, kids, they go to a party, someone hands them what looks like a Xanax pill. Um, and again, they think, well, this is, it's a prescription pill. I mean, it might not be my prescription, but someone has prescribed it, so it can't really be dangerous, right? And so the problem is that prescription pills, specifically these benzos, represent the biggest growth market for fentanyl, okay? So, so fentanyl is a drug that people generally don't want. You know, people generally don't ask for fentanyl by name, but it's cut into heroin. That was the first wave of the fentanyl overdose deaths. It was, it was cut into heroin. But, but not, that, not, that many peop, not that many Americans actually use heroin. So the problem grew when fentanyl began being cut into meth and cocaine, which are drugs that are a lot more popular in the US. But now it's gotten even, even worse because fentanyl is being cut into prescription pills, which are by far the most widely, widely taken. Um, and so this, this sort of just the tip of the iceberg, unfortunately, too, because it not even all over the country as this process started, it's, 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 it's worse in a lot of places than others, but, but pills represents this, this untapped market of, um, for fentanyl to be cut into. But, but, but something that's really strange is that drug distributors are also now adulterating adulterating fentanyl and heroin with novel benzos. So when someone is buying heroin, they might actually be getting benzos in that. So that's, you know, I've heard it's reportedly to um, facilitate theft and sexual assault. I think like knocking someone out is sometimes the goal here. Um, but yeah, it's just being, it's just crazy that fentanyl, that, um, that these drugs are being adulterated both ways opioids into benzos and benzos into opioids. So some people are referring to this combination as benzo dope. And so I think that's something you're probably going to start hearing more, hearing a lot more about. So it all adds up to uh, what some experts are calling the next opioid level crisis. So the, these cheap synthetic and much stronger novel benzos being made in China remind a lot of people of the last drug to cause such a horrible scourge on the scene in the US a few years ago, and that was fentanyl. When it came to fentanyl, everyone from the DEA on down failed to forecast the dramatic rise in deaths that was going to happen. So I want to make sure, you know, I think it's very important that we don't make the same mistake around, you know, this time around with the novel benzos. So thank you everybody for listening. Um, you can, that's my email address. Feel free to screenshot it and uh, drop me a line. I, I love talking to people. Um, I can take some questions now. I see there's a lot of uh, chat, stuff in the chat. I think people were sharing their credentials and names, but if you, um, so if I missed someone's question, please, pop it back in there. And, um, and I'm also happy to take any questions um, live. If you want to unmute yourself, I'm also happy to field anyone's questions. And um, while I'm, while, while, uh, while I'm waiting for that, I will take this opportunity to, pl to plug my next presentation, which starts at 11.15 uh, Central Time in one half hour, which is about uh, treatment, the opioid treatment drug naltrexone, which is, which is kind of controversial <clears throat> and um, going to talk about it as contrasted with methadone and buprenorphine which are the treatment drugs that you hear about the most often and are, and are the most popular. 
So we have a comment from Michelle. I read your book and loved it. This pre presentation is additionally informative. Thank you. And then to plug my book again, that's it right there, uh, Fentanyl Inc. Um, Kelly said, uh, Stacy Hansen said, I read Fentanyl Inc. I recommend a good, well-researched book. Thank you. I didn't pay any of these people. They, uh, but the check is in the mail, so thank you. Um, let's see, will your analysis, okay, so Gina Olson asks, will your analysis drug tests for benzos catch novel benzos? I would, I would seriously doubt it. Um, I, I can't imagine that especially the most recent benzos would be, would be caught by a urinalysis drug tests. Some may be better than others, but I'm, I'm skeptical. Paul McGinnis says, is fluamzenil not an antidote to a benzo overdose? So that's a good question. I'd, I'd invite anyone who might know, um, it's a GABA, GABA receptor antagonist can treat drowsiness caused by sedatives following surgery or drug overdose. Well, that certainly sounds, Sounds good. So if anyone has any, um, if anyone has any uh, comments on flumanzanil and, and its effectiveness, I, I'd be really interested to hear it. Um, anyone working on flumanzanil kits like Narcan? I am not, I'm not familiar about that. Yeah. Narcan was certainly uh, revolutionary because it was able to apply naloxone through a nasal spray. So much more effective. <clears throat> Excuse me. Do you have statistics? Excuse me. I'm going to mute myself and just cough for a second. Um, is there a method for stopping shipments from known Chinese pill mills? Well, there has been a lot of efforts undertaken on this, on, the, on behalf of this. Um, the Chinese national postal system started requiring people to put their names and addresses on these shipments. But as you can imagine, it's not very hard to get, a lot, get around. People put fake names, fake addresses. Um, and on the US side, they've really tried to, to intercept these shipments as well. Um, but, but, you know, it's really a needle in a haystack thing. There's literally millions of packages coming in to the U.S. from China every month. And a lot of them are actually shipped on in big cargo containers across the ocean. And so that's even more difficult because, you know, when we're talking about millions of doses of these chemicals that be, can be contained in a very small container or bag. And when you're talking a, a shipping container, those are, you know, as big as as big as it's a small house sometimes. So it's it's just very difficult to intercept. Um, let's see. Uh, I read that China, uh, Michelle says, I read that China may not be producing, but is sending the recipe to Mexico. That's certainly the case uh, with fentanyl and during the pandemic. I mean, you know, it's not like other countries and chemists in other countries can't make these chemicals, right? Like the US, we certainly have the capacity to make these novel benzos. In Mexico, they have it. But it's just people buy it from China for the same thing, same reason people buy so many things from China is because China does it the most cheaply. And um, they, there's just a huge infrastructure there for doing it. And so, you know, when it comes to black market um, and dark web dealers, they're going to buy it um, from the place where they can get it the most cheaply. So, um, and Adrian says, Ari, the toxicology, a typical point of care drug panel may be positive for benzodiazepines for, for, a, for an NPS benzo, but will not ascertain quantity nor type, would need more comprehensive analysis. That's, that sounds very accurate. 
one company, if you don't have access to, um, you know, the, the big expensive equipment needed to test drugs, I would recommend a company called the Bunk Police. And that's a company that makes drug checking kits. And they really are the most sort of sophisticated uh, tests I've ever seen. And they, they can test for literally hundreds of drugs and are constantly improving their methods. And so the, these kits are not expensive. They're available at bunkpolice.com. I don't know the specifics of exactly which novel benzos they test, but it's well worth going on their website. And you know they, have, they correspond to YouTube videos. So you buy these reagents and you uh, squirt a little bit onto your sample of, of whatever drug it is. And then you watch as it changes color and it, you, you, you compare it to a YouTube video that shows the color changes that can really identify which type of drug it is. So let's see. Yeah, I think this was a, a, to, in answering uh, Patricia Field's question. If these tests may not test for the specific novel, they should still test positive for, for benzos generally. So thank you. Um, Adrian, for that answer. Let's see. Seeing Justin's comments from Stacy, I can't help but wonder if the current shipping difficulties affect the illicit substance use shipping. Excuse me. So, so Stacy said, I can't help but wonder if the current shipping difficulties affect the illicit substance use shipping. Yeah, that's that's a very good point. Um, certainly, at the beginning of the pandemic, we saw actually a very significant drop in the use uh, in the importing of uh, NPS recreational chemicals from China simply because of supply chain disruptions. And, and I actually went to a, a drug lab in Wuhan, and this was before the coronavirus pandemic. And most people had never heard of Wuhan, including myself before I went there. Um, and then imagine my surprise when not long after I returned home, Wuhan was in all the news because it was the, the beginning of the pandemic. Wuhan is a city famous for its chemical industry, and it also has a lot of top caliber universities and chemistry programs. So they kind of serve as feeders for this big chemical industry. And so it is not a coincidence that so much um, recreational drugs are produced there as well as all this sort of um, this research on these different, I'm not going to get into conspiracy theories, but uh, the, the Wuhan labs that have been so much in the news so far. And so, and so yeah, there, during the, the beginning of the pandemic, um, the supply chain was really disrupted and we weren't seeing these chemicals getting to the United States. But, you know, I, I, as I say, drugs always find a way and it wasn't too long before the systems were back up and running. So you may not be able to get your kids soccer jerseys that are um, being <laughs> printed, and, you know, made in another country and shipped here. That was the case with my son. I, sons, I couldn't get their soccer jerseys for months that were made in China, but the drugs are, are starting to find a way. So uh, yeah, Kelly says, eek. Yeah, so I, I, I hear you on that. Um, so, so yeah, well, these are all these are all great comments and questions. Um, I think I got through most everyone's. Um, Justin says, "What is your prognosis based on the ease of alteration?" Uh, so I guess you're you're talking about the the analogs, the benzo analogs. So 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 yeah. So I wouldn't say this is so much rogue chemists who are in a lab and they've got the, the Xanax, the Alprazolam chemical structure and they're manipulating it slightly and then trying to create new drugs. That is what some of these genius chemists have done in the past, like Sasha Shulgin. It's referred to as the, um, as the, um, the stepladder effect or the scaffolding 
the scaffolding technique, right? Where you've got the, the chemical structure, the base chemical structure, and then you slightly manipulate it, test that, slightly manipulate, test that often on yourself. I don't think these rogue chemists are these sort of evil geniuses like that who have the time or the energy to, to be doing that. I think, as I mentioned before, they're mostly getting these chemical structures from old, um, old uh, publications and academic reports, scientific lab reports, and they're kind of just stealing them. I, I wrote about a chemist named David Nichols, who worked for Purdue, the uh, Purdue University, and he focused on um, the actions of certain chemicals that have psychedelic response, that have psychedelic action. And um, these rogue chemists just specifically targeted him. So they went through every paper he'd ever written and just started lifting all of the, the chemical processes, the techniques, and, and started making those. Um, you know, and these were drugs that had never been tested on anyone. No one had ever even taken them, but they, they started going into circulation and killing people. And so unfortunately, I think that's tends to be the way that these new drugs come on online. And another uh, really awful class of drugs are these synthetic cannabinoids. So yeah, in fact, I see, I, I see Justin, right when I said that your, your next comment came up, um, you said, so, so, what would, so what would your prognosis be based on ease of proliferation of old chemicals? We have seen similar phenomenon with synthetic cannabinoids and the work of JWH with Clemson. Yeah, that, that's exactly right. I actually visited JWH himself, John William Huffman, he now lives in North Carolina and I visited him at his house and he made, you know, dozens of these synthetic cannabinoid molecules and they were all named um, after him. They were like JWH1, JWH2, et cetera, et cetera. And he, he again had no idea that these drugs were, had crossed over into the recreational realm. Yeah, exactly. Juan, Juan says like spice and K2. That's exactly what these drugs are marketed as. And in fact, they were legal in places like uh, St. Louis and all over the country in head shops during the 2000s. You could just, yeah, you could just go into a head shop, you know, where they sell bongs or whatever, or even just gas stations and buy this stuff. And it was marketed as K2 and Spice and Scooby Snacks and all this stuff. And you could just buy these off the counter and pay, you know, $5, $10. Um, and, and it wasn't just some like nutmeg type of like, you know, like drug that didn't really get people high. I mean, these are serious drugs that cause overdoses and deaths. And, um, so, you know, I, uh, I don't think we're going to see a phenomenon like that with novel benzos being sold in stores or anything because the, the, the law in the U S has really caught up with this practice, but, but but are we going to see like a mass proliferation of these, these novel benzos? Absolutely. And I don't know if it'll be, you know, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds like the cannabinoids, but, but we're going to see them and we're already seeing them and people have to look out. So, um, so Kasia, I'm sorry if I pronounced that wrong, said Delta eight, I believe Delta eight is, um, is a legal, analog of THC marijuana, um, if I'm not mistaken. And um, so that's, you know, I, I, I don't think there has been quite the same sort of uh, death rate or sort of overdose rate associated with that. I'm, I'm not sure, but I, I don't think that one is quite as dangerous. So yeah, so Eric Nygaard said Delta is legal, has a small amount of THC, but it's sold as a CBD product. So, all right, it looks like my time is up. Um, thank you, everybody. Uh, I'll just read this last uh, uh, from Jacqueline Sinclair. We have a lot of people in our drug court program test positive for THC with Delta use. Of course, any THC is against their conditions. Yeah, I'm not surprised. So anyway, like I said, please reach out to me if you are uh, you want to talk more. I'm just going to put my email in the comments and uh, 
thank you again for everyone. This has been, uh, it has been great talking to you. Hey, thanks, Ben, for your time today. And if you want to keep the conversation going, remember, you can keep chatting um, on the platform chat. So you can just move the conversation right over there. So feel free to um, go on over there. But hey, thanks for um, spending your hour with us. And like Ben said, you can join him again um, for his next session at 1130. So you have a, a little bit of time and then hop on the next session and we'll see you again soon. Thanks, everyone.